My name is Hermann Haller. I was born in Berlin, Germany, and uh, in uh, July 6, 1924. And uh, I, I had a brother. Unfortunately, he passed. But uh, he was not. Uh, he was not in the camps. He was able to live in hiding in Belgium. In uh, so, my my parents were divorced early in, in when I was six years old. So I hardly remember my father. But uh, uh, so. I lived with my mother. First we went to a regular public school, but then the, uh, the Nazi regime ordered that Jews cannot attend public schools anymore, so we had to attend a Jewish school. My mother had a store, a furniture business in Berlin, and uh, she managed the store till 1938 when there was the so-called Kristallnacht, that November 9th. It has to have a big, big sign on the window with big letters to show that it's Sarah Anna Heller, that was the owner of the store. So anybody could see right away that it was a Jewish store. And they said, do not buy by Jews because the Jews are our misfortune. So, <coughs> He had people that came in the back, from the back, you know, so they should not see that they go and buy by Jews. And uh, we were discriminated. We, we could not go in the park. In the park, they had a, we had in our area, there was a huge park, a beautiful park. They had special benches in that park for Jews only to sit in that park. And then after a while, they didn't allow Jews at all to go into the park. We could, for instance, we used to go swimming to, uh, uh, there was a, a, a place where we could go, like a hotel or something. They had a swimming pool. You had to go there, you, you paid the nominal amount to go swimming. And then Jews were not allowed to go to use that facility. And so every day they came out with new, new rules, new, uh, new, new orders against Jewish people. Every day, this, the, the Nuremberg, that was the so-called the Nuremberg laws. That's why in, that's why in space, after the war, they had the trials in Nuremberg because that was that was where they made all those laws against against Jews. And actually not only against Jews, but against anybody that uh, was against the Nazi regime. And like I said, then came Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht was uh, was the worst. We, uh, <coughs> my mother was uh, very concerned because she had a sister that had two little children and, and they, they also had a furniture store. The whole family was in the furniture business. And she had, like I said, she had two little children and where she lived, in, in the back of the, uh, where the store was, there was, a, there was a courtyard in back of it. And in that courtyard, there was a synagogue. So my mother was very concerned about her sister. She tried to get in touch with her, couldn't get through with the telephone. So she asked me to take my bicycle and ride over to my aunt and find out what, uh, what's going on. So anyway, I, I went outside. As soon as I went outside, I couldn't ride my bicycle because the street was all covered with glass 
because they broke all the Jewish stores, they smashed all the windows, and down the street there was a synagogue on the first floor. And they were, that, that building was not only the synagogue, but there was also people were living there in the building, so they could not put fire in the synagogue. So what they did, they took all the books, the Torah scrolls, and the benches and threw it out in the street and made a big bonfire. And like I said, I could not ride my bike anymore because I was afraid it was going to cut, the, 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 the glass going to cut the, 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 the wheels from the, from the bicycle, the tires. Well, anyway, I finally, I got to the store for my aunt and it was a big mob outside and they were standing there. There was police there, there was fire department there. And the fire department was pouring water on the synagogue over there to make sure that the fire should not spread to the adjacent building, part of the building where people were living. There were not non-Jewish people were living there. So as I was mingled in with the mob, I found out that my aunt and the children were safe, that they were moved away to some neighbors in the neighborhood. They were not there. So after that, there was no way of opening the store again. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, they made a, a decree that the insurance companies were supposed to pay for the broken glass. You know, my mother had insurance on the, the showcases and all. So they declared that they did not want to give them that money. When the insurance company pays, they should not give that money to the Jewish people. So as a matter of fact, they had a meeting there with the big, big Nazi chiefs, what they're going to decide what they're going to do. So the, one of them said, well, don't let the insurance company pay to the Jews. But they said, another one said, well, the insurance company has to pay because that will give them a bad name because a big insurance company has businesses outside the Germany. So if they're not going to pay, that would give them a bad name. So they decided that, that they let the insurance company pay and then they confiscated the money and put it into the, into the Reichsbank, into the German bank. In that meeting that they had about the insurance, they put a fine on, on the Jewish people of one billion marks at the time to pay for the damages that they did. And nobody could leave the country unless he had a paper from the Internal Revenue Department that he paid his portion of the fine. And after that, uh, there was not, it was impossible to live in Germany anymore. So we had to, my mother had to make arrangements for us to leave. My mother called this brother in Antwerp and told him that he should help us to get out of Germany. So they devised a plan that they take the two children, myself and my brother, to buy a railroad ticket from the uh, uh, railroad station in Berlin, to buy a railroad ticket to Paris, from Berlin to Paris and back, return. And we should go on that, we should go, the two children, myself, my brother, we should go and pick that, go on that train which left Berlin at 12 midnight. And the train was making a stopover in Brussels, Belgium. And in Belgium, my, my uncle and his wife would be on the platform there and would take us off the train. My mother could not do the same thing. So 
dad advised that my mother should go to Aachen. Aachen is the town, border town between Belgium and, and Germany. That's the last town on the border. And over there, they would, would meet a guide to pay him, of course. And the guide would take him, it, during the night, would take him over the border. He would walk. Well, they did this, but they got caught. And they were sent back. It's not only my mother, there was a group of people, see? And they were all sent back to Germany. We were sent back to Berlin. And now we were in Belgium. And my mother was still in Berlin, so we had to make a decision. My uncle said, look, since you're out of Germany, stay out, stay here. Because, I mean, we had the ticket, we could go back, you know. But he says, it's better off, you stay here and we'll find a way for your mother to, to leave. Now, in the meantime, my uncle had to go to America because he had this, the ship came in finally. See, he, had, he, had, he, he was living in Antwerp in a boarding house, like, and he had reserved a room for us in, on the top, a, uh, he called it on the top floor, uh, an attic, an attic, yeah, an attic, yeah. attic room, yeah. Well, anyway, we stayed there, but then he had to leave because his, his ship came in. So, but we did have a distant relative living in Paris. We stayed in France about two months or three months, I don't remember exactly. But this uh, Manuel, he was afraid to let us go outside. See, now we were two young children, you know, you can... We were not actually in a prison, like, but it has a wall around it. You know, he wouldn't let us go outside, only inside the, uh, his garden there. So then he said, look, it would be better for you if you go back to Belgium, because in Belgium they would not uh, send you back, see? And so that's what he did. He did, he put us on the train and he went with us over the border again into Belgium. And we got, now, like I said, there was hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, that came illegal over the border. And uh, now you got two children there at the time. What was at the time? Was how old was I? Maybe 15. I was 15. My brother was 13. And uh, so the, the committee was there, the joint committee. They said, what are they going to do with two children? They can't leave them by, by themselves, you know? So what they did, there were other children. They were in a similar situation. And they were people citizens, Belgian citizens, Jewish people, they were very generous. They used to take the children, put them in their house and took take care of them. But we were not that lucky. We went to a family that got, there was the joint would pay them. In the meantime, my mother was now in Berlin. Now, she, she had a sister and this, as a matter of fact, this system was in that store that, that was uh, where I went to look with the synagogue in the back. And she had relatives from her husband's side that lived in London, England. And in England at the time, there was a shortage of domestic help. So if you get a, could get, uh, get a job as a domestic help, in London, the English would give you a permit to immigrate to England. And this aunt of mine did this for her sister, for my, was my mother. They got her a permit to go to England and leave Germany legally 
but she had to, of course, show that she paid the tax, the, the fine and all that. Now, we were able to write to my mother, but then in 1940, May 10, 1940, the Nazis invaded Holland, Belgium and France. They were not prepared, these countries. Like in, in France, they had what they called the Majewit Line, which was a joke. They jumped right over it. And they came with motorized equipment. Well, I remember the Belgians, they used to take taxi cups and put machine guns on there to fight them. They had no army that was not prepared for, for war. So now we couldn't write anymore, and the joint distribution couldn't send any money to those people to pay for our, for our keeps. So they throw us out in the street. You know, we were actually out in the street. Then everything was rationed because the war was going on. Food was rationed. We couldn't buy any food because we didn't have much money anyway, but we couldn't buy any food because we had no ration cards. They wouldn't give us any ration cards because they said two children by themselves, how did they, they were trying to cheat the system, you know, to get extra ration cards. Well, we were in very bad shape. So, so far, anyway, my brother was finally a, a nice, nice couple, Belgian citizen, Jewish people. They took my brother in. Madam they were very nice. They took my brother in. <laughs> but anyway, I had to look look for work. I mean, I was not allowed to work, but I looked for some kind of job. And I got a job, I found some job in a bakery. Well, then they came out, one day they came out with a decree that they needed workers to work in Germany because all the German people, the, the young people, were all in the army because there was war going on. So if you, if you sign up voluntarily to work in Germany, they would give you food and lodging, and they would pay you things. So, but we soon found out that some people, some people signed up, you know, because they had no way of making a living. So they signed up, but then we never heard from them again. I had to report to this uh, to the station there. And they, they gave me they gave me food to take along and everything. So they, what they did, they sent us to France. This whole group was only men. They sent us to France to, uh, between Boulogne and Calais because the, uh, the Nazis were building a wall, a wall as, as big, as wide as a house, all reinforced, the Atlantic Wall. That was the Atlantic Wall. They built this wall from Holland all the way through Holland, through Belgium, through France, and even to Norway, because they thought that if the Allies would make an invasion, they would come from, from opposite from France, from Boulogne Calais, because that was 30 kilometers to the British coast. See the distance. On a clear day, we could see the the cliffs of Dover, yeah, but so we had to work on this wall. They put us down there in the woods, a clearing, had, we had to clear the woods and they build the camp. We had to build this camp. They put in material, the tents and things, and we had to build the camp. It was uh, no sanitary conditions, we had no water, we had nothing. As a matter of fact, I contacted typhus. The doctors, the French doctors, treated us properly, and we stayed in the hospital there for a couple of weeks. And then one day they came, the guards came, and they said, look, 
we don't need you anymore. You have to come back to the camp. We're going to send you back to Belgium. All right, so we were very happy. We got the put us on trucks, and we went back to the camp. Sure, the camp was all broken up. Everybody was ready to leave, and they put us, put us on trains, and the train actually went to Belgium. But they didn't let us get off the train. As a matter of fact, the train went to Brussels, and then outside Brussels, there's a town called Marlene. Marlene was a big armory from World War I yet. And in this armory, they collected all the Jews, women and children, put them into this armory. And when we came, when we came from, from France, they didn't let us get off the train. They connected another train, another car, box cars, onto this our train with women and children, and they took this whole train straight to Auschwitz. We all got off the train, and we all lined up. Then they separated the men and the women and the children separate. They had guards there, you know, with, with dogs, guards. And we saw in the background, we saw people walking there with, with uniforms like pajamas, with stripes, you know. And they were whispering to us, walk, walk, walk. At first we couldn't understand what, what they meant, you know, walk. But we soon found out. Anyway, they made an announcement and they said, look, you're in Auschwitz, you're going to go to a camp and you're going to walk. And when you're going to walk, you're going to get food. And those people that cannot walk to the camp, there will come trucks, they will drive them with the trucks, they will bring them to the camp. We marched into the camp and we realized soon what these people were saying, to walk. Because these people that could not walk, older people and weak people, they took them right away to the gas chamber. They killed them all. We found out later than when we went in the camp that they killed them. As a matter of fact, we were asking when we got into the camp, just, we saw the big sign that says, Arbeit macht frei, you know, work makes freedom. And um, so we said to some of the people that, that were in the camp, we said, do you ever get out of this camp? So they said, look, see that chimney, the smoke? That's how you're going to get out. Well, anyway, they put us on a uh, what they call a quarantine in uh, in Auschwitz, and they uh, shaved shaved the head, and they put the numbers numbers on the the arm, and they put us to work. So everybody wanted to work inside, you know, because like I said, they were inside, were protected from the elements. It was very cold in, in Auschwitz, very cold. Well, I could not say I'm a mechanic because I was very young, but I had to. So, because like everybody wanted to work inside. So the company, the Krupps, they had their own people, civilian people, uh, engineers. They came there and they saw right away there's people going to go in there, they don't know what to do. They're not mechanics. So they gave them a test, see? And the test consisted, they had a vice, they put a piece of steel in there, and they gave you a file, and they tell you, file this. Now, I had a friend who was a mechanic, see? And he said, you know what you do? You tell them that you were an apprentice, because I was very young. Tell them you were three years apprentice already on the outside, and he showed me how to hold the file, and, and that's how I passed the test. 
and I was inside the factory. <laughs> Which that factory saved my life because we were not only protected from the elements, but we also protected from the roundups where they used to, every day they used to have a, a roundup where they used to take people and kill them. One day I was working the night shift. So I got up, I was in, the, in, my, in my barracks there, and I got up early in the afternoon to get out to look for some food. Because the rations that they give you was not enough to live on. So I had made friends, and I had a friend, he worked in the kitchen, and he had a little extra soup. So I got up early to get out and look for this friend. So as I got out, an, an SS guard came into the building, into our barracks. And it was, you were required to stand at attention and yell out, attention, and you have to take up the cap for this bastard there. So I yelled out, and he kept on, and, and he was going to the second floor. There was two floors in that. So he kept going and walking up the stairs. And all of a sudden he turns around and he calls me back. And he said to me, I, and I, I thought that was, he was happy with my, with my performance, you know. But he calls me back and he said, what's your name? So I said, I didn't think. He said, Herman Haller. And he says, what's your name? And then I realized what he wants. So I told him, 72554 Jew in protective custody protective custody. So he says, you follow me. I have to teach you to remember your name. So I go with him. He goes upstairs, sits on a table with the boots on a bench. And he has one of the prisoners shine his boots. And he says to me, you give me 100 knee bends. and count out loud. So I started counting. I got to 20, he says, I can't hear you, start again. <laughs> I start again. I made him 100. So then he says, give me 100 more, but count backwards. So I count, give him 100 more and count backwards. It's a good thing I understood German, you know. I was in my favor yet. So then he said, lay down on the floor and give me 10 push-ups. So with the last strength, I gave him 10 push-ups. Then he said, turn around the back, give me 10 more push-ups. So I couldn't do it anymore. I was totally exhausted. So he took out his gun, put it out on my head, says, you give me 10 push-ups, I'll shoot you right now. So with the last strength, I was able to give 10 push-ups. In the meantime, all my friends were standing outside already waiting because we had to go to work. You know, they were waiting for me. So he said, after the last 10 push-ups, I said, okay, rouse. So I went out to my friends and I said, look, I can't go to work now because I'm totally exhausted, you know. So they said, well, you have to go to work because if you don't go to work, you know what's going to happen. Because you'll be sick, they're going to take you to the crematorium. So they took me. Then we were marching out in rows of five, in columns of ten, and they put me in the middle, and they supported me on both sides, and we made it to the factory. I got into the factory. 
I got in the factory, you know, I worked in the machine shop, you know, be a busy, I'm a mechanic now, see. So in the machine shop, in the back of the machine shop, they had ovens there where they used to harden the products, you know, the steel. You know, the steel is not hard enough, you know, that goes, they dip it in oil and then they put it in a furnace like 1500 degrees, you know, it's all red. But during the night, this department did not work. The, see, the machine shop was working, but the uh, hardened department did not work. So they put me in there, and they put me in a cabinet. There was a big cabinet where they used to keep tools. And they pushed the tools aside, and they put me in there inside the cabinet, and they made, this is my hospital, to rest. You rest, if they're looking for you, we're gonna look, we're gonna let you know. Another incident I had, they took me down, yeah, in that factory, there, there was one section where, they, where the group of people worked. They worked on a furnace where they used to take the tongs, they took out this this uh, metal they were they had, the, and they put it in to 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 cool off. Anyway, even the Nazis said that these guys have worked special hard. They need a special ration. What does the ration consist of? Well, in in Auschwitz they had this, a special kitchen for the guards where the butchers used to work in there. The butchers were prisoners themselves, you know. They, they, on the outside, they were, they were butchers. And they, they had them work in the kitchen and they made sausages and stuff for the guards, not for us, for, for the guards. They could eat inside, they could eat whatever they wanted, but they could not take anything out. As a matter of fact, they had to go inside, take off the clothes, put on different clothing, clean. And um, so we figured out how could we get some of the sources out from there, you know. Well, I was there already a long time, see. So in this machine shop where we had, there was a section there, it was a tinsmith shop a tinsmith shop, you know. A tinsmith, you know what a tinsmith is? <laughs> tinsmith, where they make uh, exhaust pipes and everything out from sheet metal. Sheet metal, yeah. Well, yeah, so, oh, oh, wait, I, I, I jumped ahead of it. Anyway, they had this place where they had these butchers. They worked there and they made sausages for the guards. And the sausages, they were cooked in water, boiled, and this water, normally, they throw that out. This greasy, greasy water. But this water, they made for a special ration for those people that work extra hard. So they had these big kettles, army kettles, the, the thermos, thermos kettles like they use in the army. They had two kettles like that and they filled them up with this water. And I had to go and pick that up. They gave me a horse with a wagon. The wagon was just a board over four wheels, no springs or anything. But I had two horses. And I had to take those two kettles, bring them to this kitchen. And I was not allowed to go in. The procedure was that they, I knocked on the door and a guard came out to see who was there and then he used to call one of the prisoners. They took the two kettles, take them inside, they filled them up and they helped me put them back on the wagon and I used to bring it back to the factory. So we figured out how could we smuggle out some of these sausages. Eh? 
Well, like I said, we had the tinsmith shop. The tinsmith shop devised a false bottom for the kettles. And they put this they put the sausages in, put the false bottom on top, and then put the water, the greasy water in it, and do a board it back to the camp, and we had sausages. Well, anyway, one day this guy comes, he wants to come with me. He says, you can't come because you don't have the paper. He had the paper. So we got to, the, to this kitchen, and like the procedure was, they knocked on the door, they picked up the kettle and bring it out. And then he brings it out, they bring out the kettles, you know, no, no, they're heavy now, and so usually they used to help me to lift it up and put it up. Well, the guard was there, an SS guard. He says, halt, open up the kettle. He takes a broom. A boom takes the handle from the boom and he starts to measure the kettle inside and outside. He starts to mix it all, mix around. And I'm standing there with my heart in my pants. Can you imagine? This guy disappeared. The, this so called friend that wanted to come along, he disappeared. And this guy measures it inside, outside, stirs around. And for nothing, close it up, he says, out. Nothing happened. They put the kettles back on the wagon there. I brought them to the, back to the factory there. They opened it up. The bottom, the false bottom was gone. Nothing was there, no sausages, no false bottom. We didn't know what happened. So at night when we went back to the camp, I went to this barracks where the, where the butchers were, and I asked him, what happened? So he says, well, somebody squealed on you, so he was able to remove the false bottom and hide it, and that's how we were safe. We went on a death march. You heard about the death march? Yeah, and the death march is in, in January 18. January 1945, the Russians had moved up in the east. That's the uh, Auschwitz is in the east in Poland. We could hear, we could hear the artillery and the cannons, the fire. We could hear them that they were getting closer and closer. The Allies, the Allied forces, moved up from the west. You know, the Americans and the English, they moved up from the west. Well, they decided to evacuate Auschwitz. And that's when we went on the death march. Um, the death march is uh, unbelievable. It was bitter cold. We, we marched from Auschwitz to, uh, to a town there where they had railroad cars, open cars, not even covered, open cars. They put on that car 110 people on my car, 110 people in the, that car. It was a little straw on the floor, that's all. And uh, no food, nothing. I was, we were riding days and nights. People, People were drinking their own urine. Because you, get a, you can't live without food, but you can't live without water. See, I was lucky. I was on the side, on the wall from the train, and it was snowing. And I used to eat the snow. I was able to push my arm out and grab some snow and eat the snow. From the 110 people that were on that car, was only seven of us alive, all died. We used to take the dead bodies around to protect us, you know. And we couldn't get off the train. Now Buchenwald was a 
Was it in Germany? It was near uh, Weimar. And uh, the prisoners in Buchenwald was many Germans that were in Buchenwald, not Jewish, Germans, people that were against the Nazi regime, you know, socialist, communist, and like, and they were, they were very nice. They wanted to help us, so they had to carry us off the train. Took us off, seven people. They brought us in, up to, into the camp, and uh, they put us into the sick bay. I was in block 60, 67, I remember. And the commandant from that camp didn't, the, the ration, the ration that they got, he took away the bread. He said, sick people are not productive. They don't have to eat that much. So they gave us only that soup, so-called soup. But we didn't stay there long. After a few weeks, I think, four weeks. Four, four weeks about there. there. They came one morning. I seen the soldiers come in was American soldiers. They liberated the camp. I was so sick, I didn't realize that this was Americans. I said, yet, what kind of a guards are they sending us in to guard us now, see? But they were American soldiers. And the American soldiers, they saw those starving people, so they gave them all the rations, what they had. They gave it to the people and they were eating it and they were dying like flies from eating because they couldn't digest that food. But the very sick people like myself, I was so sick, I was frozen, I lost my toes from the cold. And they took us out the American soldiers, they took us out, they brought us into Weimar. Weimar is the, the town next to Buchenwald. And they put us up into hospital, German hospitals. There are German doctors and nurses, and they, were, they took good care of us, you know. They made sure that, gave us the proper food, they gave us like baby food, you know, and, and not rich food. And uh, I know while we were there in this hospital, <coughs> the Allies had made an agreement when they had an, uh, the Allies, there was the Russians, the, Germ the uh, French and the Americans and English, they had this uh, conference in Yalta, you know, which, and they, they had made an agreement that if the war ends, that any displaced person could go wherever he wants to go, is free. You know, there was millions, millions of displaced persons because the Nazis took whoever they didn't put in concentration camps, they put them, sent them from Germany, they sent them to France, they sent them to Poland, from Poland, they sent them to wherever they were. Millions of people went all over. Well, anyway, when the war ended, from the different countries, they had sent delegations to find their citizens, to bring them back to the countries where they came from. So one day, a Belgium delegation came from Belgium, and I told them I would like to go back to Belgium. I don't want to go back to Germany. I want to go back to Belgium. And they said, okay. So they put me down, and the Americans took us. They stripped us, took us all, all our clothes, and burned it all <laughs> because we were full of lice and everything, and disinfected us. They sprayed us with uh, disinfecting. And they put us on, the, on a plane a big, huge transport planes and stretches. There was one on top of the other, yeah. I think three high. And they flew us back to Belgium. 
I put them back to Belgium. They gave us a big reception in Belgium. All the citizens were standing in line, shaving us up. And they put us right back to a hospital in, Bel in Brussels, in Belgium. I was in St. Gilles Hospital in Belgium. And then we stayed in the hospital for a while, and then they, uh, then, then they put us up to recuperate in a, in a home. They had a villa that was, a, as a matter of fact, was donated from the Queen. She had a villa somewhere outside Brussels, and she donated that for us to recuperate there. And they had doctors there and nurses, and they gave us proper food and, and make sure every day the doctor examined us. I had to walk with crutches and then with canes and so on. But uh, that's how we, we survived in there. I was liberated in 45, April 11. My second birthday, April 11, 1945. The uncle that was in America, there was another uncle, I had two uncles, and that were another uncle that went to America already earlier. For, he was living in New Brunswick, in New Jersey, New Brunswick. You know, and he had a farm over there. Well, he sent me papers, you know, papers to come to the to the United States and he, he vouched vote for me that I could work on his farm and and it'll take care that I won't be a burden to the state. <laughs> That's how you had to have. Not like today they go they bring everything over here. That's how I came. In those days you had to have a sponsor. You had to have, had a, sponsor. a sponsor. I had to have a sponsor. Right. And he sent he sent me he sent me the money that time to get on a ship to come here. And there was no passenger ship. There was, I, I came on a Marine Falcon. That was a troop, troop carrier. So I went to New York and my other uncle, the, the one that used to be in Belgium, he was settled already in, in, in America. He went to the army and then after the army, he, he opened the store, he had a, he had a business, he had a store of uh, juvenile furniture and, and, yeah, and toys, ju juvenile furniture and toys, yeah. So I went to him and he says, look, you can stay here uh, as long till you get the job, till you get settled. And all. Found a job, in all kinds of jobs, <laughs> till I finally, uh, then, I joined, I joined this New World Club, you know, this uh, old, uh, was a club that had refugees that came from Germany. They had a club, and that's where I met my wife. Uh, we got married, and uh, we had two girls, and then I had, I had a, then we bought, we bought a home. I had uh, a neighbor neighbor of mine, Bill, was my neighbor. He, he worked for the Transit Authority. He was an inspector. He says, why don't you come and work by us, you know? And I, I didn't want to hesitate. I, I had a job, you know, it was, was uh, not the greatest job, but it was a job. I was able to buy a home, and, uh, and the boss was not too bad. So, but then finally he convinced me and I took the test. You had to take a test, a city test, you know, and to get the job. So I got to work for the Transit Authority for 20 years. I have uh, two children and uh, grandchildren, uh, three, four grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. 